So it wasn't terrible. This is <laughs> the Griswold Richardson. I understand. Lecture. <laughs> Dr. Arnold Griswold was uh, in the uh, 1940s and 50s, chair of the Department of Surgery here, a true visionary and, and legend in the world of uh, surgery and trauma. He established. Morning. Among his many other accomplishments. Good morning. Role for operative intervention for penetrating cardiac trauma at a time when people didn't operate on gunshot wounds and stab wounds to the heart. You either lived or died on your own. Dr. Griswold in his New England Journal of Medicine publication uh, outlined the role for operating on such patients. And I thought, you know, these were always just minor little stab wounds and things, but if you read his paper, he had every bit the kind of terrible penetrating trauma that we have today. And um, a lot of those patients died. But in the paper, he gives full credit to the residents because at a time before cell phones and pagers, guess where Dr. Griswold was? When... And the residents are, were the ones who saved the patient's life or not. And so uh, very interesting to read his original papers. Uh, also now hyphenated to the Griswold Lecture is Dr. J. David Richardson, whom all of you know, passed away a couple of years ago, and uh, was similarly a true visionary and legend in the world of trauma surgery, was president of everything you could be president of in American surgery virtually, and uh, certainly in his own way made many pioneering advances uh, with the rest of the team here at the University of Louisville. In the honor of Drs. Griswold and Dr. Richardson, we have this lectureship now each year. Dr. Harbrecht is going to introduce our speaker. Thank you. And uh, I think, first of all, uh, all of us really deserve uh, a great deal of thanks to Dr. McMasters for reinvigorating this lecture after a several years uh, to honor the history that um, uh, trauma care has had at the University of Louisville for decades. So, again, for the students and the younger residents, it's really worthwhile kind of looking back and, and seeing kind of what came before. There's a lot that we can all learn from. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. David Spain. Uh, Dr. Spain. Um, uh, did his medical school training uh, at Wayne State and did his residency in New Jersey. Uh, he then came here and uh, did a critical care fellowship, uh, was one of the early pioneers of that fellowship. Uh, it was actually my critical care fellow uh, when I was a senior resident uh, here uh, just a couple of years ago. Um, uh, he's a very accomplished surgeon. He was on faculty here for several years and then went to take the uh, the chief job at uh, Stanford, where he has been uh, probably for the last uh, a couple of decades. And uh, he follows in a long line of accomplished surgeons from Louisville making impacts in uh, trauma care. He has just recently completed uh, a, a tour as the president of the AAST, the American Association for the Surgery of Trauma, which is probably the largest trauma organization. Uh, and uh, it's worth noting that there's a, uh, a long history of, of Louisvillians who have served as president, uh, including the two gentlemen who this lecture is named for. Uh, Dr. Spain has continued that line. Uh, he's a, a leader in the field. He's got a lot of novel ideas. Uh, he's been incredibly productive, uh, leveraging not only his own interests, uh, with many of the resources that he has at Stanford to have a very productive uh, research career in addition to huge contributions to his community. Pleasure to wake, welcome David to uh, Dr. Spain to uh, give this lecture. Well, thanks for having me. It's an incredible honor and uh, great to be back. I was telling the story last night, I think one of the first cases I did here was a ruptured aneurysm and 
Brian was a chief, and I think he said about seven words during the whole case. Um, but, it's, but it's great to be back. Uh, I was telling the people last night, I'm, I'm not the most sentimental person you'll ever meet, um, but getting to come back and meet old friends and, and uh, you know, go, come back to where it all started has been crucial. And it is important to remember that. So I was here from 99 to 2001, and, and, and these were the people that really had a huge influence. Obviously, Dr. Polk created the environment where all this flourished. Eddie Carrillo was sort of my running mate. We were the two you know, junior trauma surgeons at the time and took a lot of call and our offices were right next to each other. We had a great time and uh, you know, I still keep in contact with Eddie, but we had a lot of fun and wrote a lot of great papers together. Dr. Garrison who's here is, was my research mentor. He was a person that really taught me how to ask and try to answer critical questions. Uh, Frank Miller was the teacher's, the surgeon's surgeon. You know, any any surgeon or family member in town that needed an operation came to see Frank. And and then as uh, Dr. Harbreck mentioned, Dr. Richardson, you know, had a genius for understanding organizations and why he was president of everything. So these people really helped set the foundation for everything that I was, I've been able to do in my career. And if we're being honest, there was one one other person. Uh, Brenda Beck, who was my administrative assistant while I was here. Brenda just, she was one of those people that just got things done quietly without any fuss or fanfare. So I, I want to talk a little bit today about teaching. And uh, I'll go over a little bit about why, why I picked this topic. So yeah. my endowed chair is named after David Gregg, who was a, a surgeon that worked at Stanford, and uh, we got a gift from a grateful patient who actually happened to be a longtime friend of Dr. Gregg's, and so the patient uh, gave a large gift to our department in, in his name and created this endowed chair, which is, provides a lot of resources for us to do things. But David was a, kind of a unique guy. He was in private practice at the Menlo Clinic, which is a small multi-specialty clinic uh, just uh, outside of Stanford. and. He, when I got there, he took trauma call and general surgery call at Stanford, and that's very different from the model here, but it was similar to what I had seen as a resident. So I said, all right, I'll keep the guy around, see what happens. And he was great. He was just a great surgeon, good person, you know, somebody I could always rely on. And he retired uh, from his private practice job and then joined us and worked full-time until he really retired. And at his retirement, I, you know, I got to thinking, like, when I retired, which I started to think about, and I said, what, what would I want people to think about me? And I really came up with three things, right? I really thought, I, I hope people would say I was a good surgeon, you know, maybe even a healer. I hope people would say I, I was a good teacher, you know, maybe even an educator. And then I hope people would say I was a good researcher, you know, maybe even a scholar. But, you know, when you're giving grand rounds at a major academic medical center, trauma center like, like Louisville, that's pretty intimidating. Like, what, what am I going to come here and tell you that you don't already know or don't do better than we do? You know, so I could talk about clinical care and research, but really, like, you know, this is, this is the, you know, home ground for one of the most productive and innovative trauma centers in the country. So what am I going to tell you about research and clinical care you don't know? So, I, you know, I usually say I'll think I'll, I'll focus on teaching because I think it's something I'm good at. <clears throat> But, every, but the reason I'm a good teacher is because of everything I learned here. So it's also intimidating to come here and talk about teaching, but I'm, but I'm going to give it a try. So we're going to talk a little bit about who dares to teach. And, and this quote comes, comes from a, a guy named John Cotton Dana, and he was a really interesting character. And he born in uh, Vermont in the you know, mid-1800s, um, very established New England family. He ultimately studied law at Dartmouth, and then he moved out to Colorado for he had some asthma, so he thought the fresh air would be better for him, and uh, sort of bounced around and got married and kind of was unsettled for a few years, and then eventually moved back to Denver in, in 1889 to become their director of the public library and uh, served as their first librarian there. And then they moved back to Massachusetts for a few years, and then ultimately he settled in Newark, New Jersey where he spent you know, 20 plus years as the director of their library. And during that time, he also established the Newark Museum. 
But he was a real innovator, much like Griswold. He was a little bit of a maverick. So when he was in Denver, he pioneered the first ever collection of children's literature. When he was in uh, Springfield, Massachusetts, he took down the railings, because in those days he used to go in and you know, look at the, you know, whatever book you wanted, you tell the library what you wanted, then they would go back and get the book for you. You, you couldn't walk around amongst the stacks. He thought that was wrong. Like he thought the patrons should be able to just walk through the library. As he said, the shelves should be open, you know, there should be cheerful and accommodating atmosphere, which is a complete opposite of what libraries were then. And then in Newark, you know, he, he, he realized you know, who was there and, you know, much of the working class had no access to the library. It was open from 8 a.m. till 4 in the afternoon. You know, people were working, they didn't get off of work till 5 or later, and then the library was closed, they couldn't get in. So he extended the hour so that working class people could come in the evenings and get books. There was a huge immigrant population in Newark, so he established foreign language collections. And then he also developed a special community or a special collection for the business community. So arguably, he established the first children's library in the United States, and he established the first business library in the United States. And so actually to, to, to honor him, there's actually a, a Dano Award given out by the librarians every year for the most innovative library in the United States. But he was also a social maverick. So this is this quote's from the early 1900s. If you take a look at this, he says, you know, every woman should be trained for a job. They should take the uh, advantage of every possibility to promote the independence of women. And no woman should be expected to stay home and take care of her parents any more than the men should be expected to. This is, you know, 1920s. So he was pretty, pretty provocative and innovative person. But his quote that I really love is he says that who dares to teach must never cease to learn. So we're going to talk a little bit about who dares to teach. I'm going to talk a little bit about the learning environment, what's changing, talk about what an effective uh, educator looks like, and then at the end we'll talk a little bit about what the engaged learner looks like. Now the first premise of, of teaching and surgery is that, you know, excellence in patient care is kind of the foundation of everything we do. Like if we're not providing great patient care, then the rest of this doesn't really matter. So that's the really basic foundation of this. But, you know, the learning environment has been changing a lot in the last, you know, 10 or 15 years, especially. And, you know, but surgical teaching has been going on now for, you know, a couple hundred years and really sort of started out from apprenticeship models into residency training. But, you know, the various forms, interoperative teaching, that's actually uh, me and one of my partners, Joe Forrester, who's actually teaching me how to operate. He's, he's uh, innovated our uh, chest wall stabilization program. And so he's teaching me how to operate. You know, bedside teaching and formal lectures like this have all been around for quite a while and form the basis of much of what we do in surgical teaching. Um, you know, but intraoperative teaching is still the most important thing that we do. But Socratic teaching, didactics, and even simulation are becoming much more common, right? As surgical care gets more and more complicated, you know, there has to be other ways to, to teach and to introduce new ideas. So you can see like, you know, here's, you know, sort of low fidelity simulators. This is a situation where we're, you know, sometimes there's these rare but important events that are hard to train for. So this is a session we did with our neurosurgery residents. They had a couple of acute airway issues after cervical spine operations. They didn't know how to do cricothyroidotomy. So we, we do so airway workshop with the neurosurgery residents. And you, you can see me here in the background. I look really interested here. And then, you know, lately ultrasounds become a huge part of what we do. So how do, how do you introduce that? How do you teach that to residents? You know, and these are all being new challenges that have come about in the last, you know, 15 mm -hmm. to 20 years. But, you know, it, but it's good because you can use these things to handle rare events. And, you know, even low fidelity simulators like this can have a huge uh, impact on learners' ability to, to pick up new skills. And they don't have to be fancy. This is a really simple, you know, sort of suturing kit in a box with a small camera. And, you know, you can use this to, to assess basic skills. Now, you know, the big question becomes, how does this translate to patient care? But I think there's reasonable data that that practice on simulation can help your interoperative skills. And I think you can, you know, in integrate this, you know, virtual reality and learning into training. Um, 
but you, you know, have to be thoughtful about it. But you can use this especially for skills that are rare but necessary. And hopefully can help with the limited time constraints that we're all facing. You know, when in addition to, to the you know, changing environments and skills, there's, there's always new things to learn clinically, right? So I, I think for me, laparoscopic was the first big disruptive force in clinical care in the last you know, 100 years. So and I remember I was, a, I think, about a third year resident when the first paper came out in, in Journal of the American College of Surgeons describing laparoscopic cholecystectomy. And I remember sitting in the library reading it, and I think, you know, he just took a perfectly good operation and screwed it up. And and now, you know, I, I would, you know, I would much rather have a lap coli than an open one. And so, you know, this completely changed the way we approach a lot of operations. You know, and so now this is actually that same Joe Forrester here actually taking his younger brother, Jared, through a lap coli a couple years ago when Joe was a chief and Jared was a third year resident. Um, but, you know, this completely changed the way we teach surgery and take care of patients. You know, and now we have the robot. Now, I, I, I'm too old to, you know, Intuit is down the road from us, like five miles from my house, and they keep bugging me to come and I'm like, I'm too old to learn how to operate on the robot. But I do think there are certain things where it's a big advantage. I think it's been oversold a little bit for a lot of, for some things, but I think in certain operations, I, you know, I was recently watching the urologist do a prostatectomy and Sewing, sewing the bladder back in, and you know, sewing in the male pelvis on the, you know, the left hand side from nine o'clock to twelve o'clock. It, it's that's a challenge, and they're doing it robotically. It was actually pretty slick, but you know, this is a whole new thing that we have to teach our residents. So we had to we had to come up with a whole curriculum and, and a process for our residents to go through, so that you know they could get certified or at least you know introductory skills on the robot. So there are things they have to do, you know, before as a PGY-1, go to the simulator and practice uh, some of these modules, some online safety things they need to do. Then they need to go to our sim center and practice some skills and document a certain level of proficiency. And then as a, a second year resident, there's some bedside assist where you're, at, you know, working at the, at the bed, exchanging instruments and, and um, assisting there. And then ultimately, working on the console with the attending. And all this just has to be documented and take care of. And this, you know, this is all completely new stuff that's come around in the last five years. But again, for our residents, as they're finishing training and going out into practice and trying to get privileges, you know, it's critical that we are able to document that they've had this necessary training. So this is a whole new thing that we've had to add to our, to our program in the last couple of years. You know, and then all of a sudden, like, you know, and rapid changes in the teaching environment. COVID-19 came around. We had to switch to virtual teaching. We learned pretty quickly that we could do this. Um, and I think it's been a, helpful in a lot of ways. But you know, you can see one of our HPB surgeons drawing on, you know, on a whiteboard on Zoom. You know, and I think that we learned that, that uh, we could rapidly change how we teach uh, when this happened. You know, but I also think one of the things we, we got to be careful of is, is a little bit of technology creep. This is a common sight in, in our ICU, right? Everybody's got a, well, we, we used to call them computer on wheels, but we can't call them that. House seems derogatory, so they're wows now, like workstations on wheels. You know, so everybody's standing around a computer, you know, this guy's talking on his cell phone. And uh, this was very common in our ICU. So a couple of years ago, we actually changed the rules. Like no more. We actually have to round in the room. There can only be one computer. The residents have to present without a computer, so they have to, you know, be able to actually stand up and look you eye to eye and talk to you. There's one computer in the back, so somebody can put orders in while we're talking. And we actually have the nurse present the patient on rounds, and then the resident provides a plan. So I think, it, you know, limiting the the computer, we're, we're back at the bedside, interacting with the patient and the nurse. And actually, this is been a huge plus for our team and we've continued this years later now we still have when we make ICU rounds our nurses actually present the patients to us and then we develop a plan. But I do think you got to be careful of letting this technology while it's great in a lot of ways sometimes it does interfere with your interactions with the patient. So in addition to, to new clinical things there's always non-clinical things that we need to teach. 
and this has really been a huge change in the last couple of years. You know, healthcare just doesn't happen in a bubble, right? So we've learned our social determinants of health. I, I was talking to somebody, you know, three or four or five years ago, if you'd have told me, asked me about social determinants of health, I would not have known what you're talking about. And if you'd have then explained it to me, I, I wouldn't have thought it was important. And now it's clearly, you know, crucial. And so, you know, because this has a huge impact on patients' outcomes, right? And so, you know, that, you know, even before and after acute care surgery problems, you know, patients' social determinants of health have a huge impact on what happens to them. You know, we've learned that there's huge disparities in healthcare. COVID-19 really has brought a lot of this to the forefront and made it pretty obvious. I mean, these always existed, but it was hidden a lot. It made it hard to, to hide those during COVID-19. You know, when you see headlines like this, black children are more likely to die after surgery than their white peers, it's kind of hard to start ignoring this stuff. And then there's also non-technical skills that we've now learned how to, how to um, that are important to patient outcomes. Now we've done, I've done a series of studies with a group out of Vanderbilt looking at issues with non-technical skills and professionalism and communication and surgeons who have problems with, uh, you know, communication and professionalism have 14% higher risk adjusted complication rate than surgeons who don't. And, you know, we don't think this is just because, you know, patients who have complications are more likely to complain. There's something about miscommunications, I think, that are important. So again, these non-technical skills, how do we communicate? You know, how do we work in, in multidisciplinary care, you know, teams and communicate effectively? You know, back in the old days, you know, you were the doctor, everybody just did what you said. That doesn't work anymore. And so how, how as you, as a professional, participate in these cross-disciplinary, multidisciplinary teams and communicate with the patients? So again, it's a huge impact on, on patient outcomes. And again, how do we teach these? You know, as, you know, we're getting busier and busier, the time's getting more and more compressed. And you, how do you build all these things into a surgical residency? where the residents are already working 80 hours a week and, you know, their time's already at a premium. So I think, you know, some of the key is I think you really have to be flexible. Um, you have to be open to varied opportunities and topics. You know, we've, we've included some non-technical skills. We have communication workshops that our, our residents go to. Um, you know, we've had some uh, uh, coaching set up, set up for our residents. Um, I think there's a lot of things that we really have to be open to. Probably one of the most beneficial things we did in our residency, probably about 10 years ago, is we hired a uh, psychologist. And she's really a performance psychologist. She's not, not really a therapist psychologist. She's a performance psychologist and used to work for the 49ers. And she actually meets with our residents on a regular basis. But each class will meet with her like three or four times a year as, as a group and to help coach them and, and how to optimize their performance. And so, again, some of these non-technical skills, non-clinical skills can be huge. And we've used a lot of simulation. I mean, to me, it makes a lot of sense, right? If you're a surgery resident, you should have to go to the simulation center, spend a certain amount of time on a trainer, show some level of proficiency on that trainer before you're allowed to go to the OR and start tricks, sticking laparoscopic drill cards in a patient, right? To me, that makes sense. Now, can I prove that it makes a difference? That's part of the problem. And there's also, it takes a lot of time and some, ex some expense to be able to do that. And does it really translate to better outcome to the patient or to the trainee? And I think it's been hard to demonstrate that, but, but intuitively it makes sense to me that, that you, know, you should have to spend a certain amount of time practicing on a simulator before you're actually allowed to practice on a human being. But again, proving that and, and making sure that it's worth the investment of time and effort and money before we make that requirement has been one of the challenges. And then there's a huge bias in this towards laparoscopic and robotic surgery, right? Because it's easy to video capture that, um, you know, and so what do you do with open surgical skills? Much harder to, to capture those. Um, so again, you know, we can do it for some of what we teach, but not all of it. I think the other key thing is, is all these things have to meet the, the needs of the learner. And one of the things I don't know that we've paid enough attention to is not everybody learns 
surgery the same way. And we tend to have a sort of one size fits all. I, I, it's sort of dawned on me a little bit, you know, we've, there's a lot of talk about precision medicine, it's a big thing in our place. You know, what's this patient need? Diagnose this patient's specific needs and address them, you know, in, in a precise manner. But in surgical education, it's kind of a one size fits all thing. And so, you know, I was thinking about this whole, why, why, why aren't we more precise with our surgical education? Not every resident learns technical skills the same way. There's some data that actually suggests that as groups, men and women don't learn technical skills the same way, but we tend to teach everything the same way. And so can we ever get to a place where we can start this standard or uh, individualized uh, learning for the resident? I, I think we can get there. I think some of the pieces are starting to get in place. The Board of Surgery is kicking off the surgical EPA pro project. I think this is going to help, you know, diagnose and, and determine what, what are the specific needs of each president, but it remains to be seen. <coughs> now, again, if there's going to be effective learning, there also has to be an effective teacher. So what does an effective teacher look like? I know what an effective teacher looks like. It looks like this guy. <laughs> Right. Frank Miller was far away one of the best teachers I've ever seen, you know, and uh, actually had to like rename the Frank Miller Award and retire it because he just kept winning it year after year. But I think the first year they named it the Frank Miller Award, Dr. McMaster realized he was still eligible and nominated it. So I think, I think Frank won the Frank Miller Award the first year they had it. And then after that, they said no more. But Frank was a master teacher. I mean, he was incredible. But how, how did he do it? And I don't know, I think there are a few, you know, sort of born teachers out there. He was one of them. So, there, you know, there's surprisingly little data out there about what an effective teacher in surgery looks like. And so there was a paper a few years ago and, uh, you know, they did a meta-analysis. They found something like 23 articles that, that talked about what an effective teacher in surgery looks like. But three-fourths of those articles didn't even define what an effective teacher was. So how do you, how do you, if there's no definition, how do you know what it is? So there are probably like two studies that I thought were pretty, pretty helpful and, and, uh, and informative on this. So one was a, a first one came out of Penn and they, they just surveyed their surgery residents, 77 of them, got like a 56% response rate. And they asked the residents, you know, give us three faculty names that you think are exceptional surgeon educators. And so there were 72 faculty in the department at that time, you know, majority men, a handful of women. And there were uh, 45, got at least one nomination, so almost two thirds of them. And then there were a handful of 12 surgeons that got multiple nominations from these 40 something residents who said that they were exceptional educators. So they went to these 12 educators and they interviewed them in depth. And this is one of the things I had to educate myself, right? Uh, they use this grounded theory model, and, and this is pretty common in qualitative uh, research methods. You know, most of what we do is quantitative stuff, right? We need numbers, we need a p-value, right? But in social sciences, a lot of it's qualitative. And so you interview people with these open-ended questions, and then you analyze their interviews using this inductive and iter iterative approach. And then you use those concepts to sort of build a model and you keep doing the interviews until you saturate the model, which is, you know, their further interviews don't really define any new or contradictory concepts. And surprisingly, you can build a model out of this with usually somewhere around 12 to 15 interviews. So they had 12 people. And, and these 12 surgeons basically identified four themes of an effective surgical educator. So first was the patient. Right, it had to be centered around learning, had to be centered around the patient. Second was the learner, the resident. The third was the educator, the attending surgeon. And then the fourth was the whole culture of education in the institute. So these were the four central domains that these 12 surgeons identified. So again, 12 of the 12 surgeons said that right, exceptional patient care was a core tenet of excellent surgical education. So as I said at the beginning, right, if we're not providing great care, the rest of this doesn't matter. So fantastic patient care, basis that all, this all happened. 
you know, the majority of them emphasized individualized learning. So this idea of sort of trying to be precise about what the resident needs. Seven of the 12 thought multimodality teaching was important. Again, so bedside teaching, interoperative teaching, lectures, you know, having a variety of, of different environments in which the residents can learn. And then training, uh, training autonomy, but not operative autonomy. This is educational autonomy. Having control over your own education was important. And again, the, the, for, the, for the educators themselves, 11 of the 12, but uh, yeah, the, the education being important to them was one of the core tenets. You have to have a love for the profession. And most of them had a prominent past mentor. Frank, you had to have a Frank Miller in your life. You, you know, work really committed to this. And then they talked a little bit about the culture. And one of the things they talked about, and this was this idea of, of uh, psychological safety. Now, this is one of those things I've had to sort of learn about. I wrap my head around. But you know, this idea as a learner, sometimes if you're trying to learn something new or different, you, you do have to admit what you don't know. And if you admit something you, you don't know in front of your attending and they sort of, you know, chastise you, that's, that, that's not a positive message, right? And so the message is, you know, don't admit what you don't know. And so this idea that you, that you need to have a cultural safety, right? that you need to be able to have an environment where it's okay to admit what you don't know, what you need to improve on. Um, it's, this one's taken me a little while to sort of wrap my head around this idea of, a, of a psychological safety. And then accountability, right? We all have to be accountable for the education, both the learner and the educator. And obviously this collegiality, you know, we're in this together, We've got to do this together. So again, these, these, these 12 surgeons chosen by their own residents espouse educational values that support sort of a cognitive-based learning model. And to them, these ideas of learner autonomy, accountability, the importance of mentors and education, to them, they thought this sort of harkened back to the traditional Halsteadian values of, of surgical education. But at the same time, these, you know, these same educators saw the utility of newer approaches, such as creating a culture of a, a, a culture of psychological safety, using multimodality learning, and using teaching as a as a means to prevent self burnout. And then, and then they thought this demonstrated the importance of dynamic, individualized learning. And this is where I disagree with them a little bit. So they say, in contrast to the increasing standardized and competency-based approach the best educators seem to follow specific principles to customize education for each learner. So I agree with the part about the standardized approach. I think the competency-based education, and especially this you know, EPA and trustable professional activities that's coming down from the board, I actually think that if you really use the competency-based approach correctly, it actually allows you to figure out what each resident needs to work on and then individualize it. So, I, I, yeah, I agree, standardized approach, not a great idea, but I don't think the competency-based approach has to be standardized. I actually think the advantage of it is that it can be individualized. So I think that's really where we need to go. Now, the other paper that I thought was pretty good about outlining what an effective educator is, is this one. And uh, this is a group that did that meta-analysis that oh, there's not much out there. So they did a, they did a similar study. Basically, they, they used the same methodology as the last study. They interviewed their senior residents, said, you know, but rather than going in and asking the attendings, what do you think a good educator was? They actually asked the residents, what do you think a good educator looks like? And so they, you know, did the same sort of approach. And so they got 13 residents, seven men, six women, um, you know, different backgrounds, and then sat down and, and uh, interviewed these residents. And again, same thing got data saturation after about 13 interviews. And they ranked as most important, excellent communication, positive learning environment, timely constructed feedback, and then technical expertise. And if you think about it, these are a lot of the same themes, right? Excellent patient care requires tech, you know, good technical expertise, feedback, you know, and, and uh, a positive learning environment. They're, they're much the same thing. Same themes. 
And so, you know, general surgery residents believe that effective educators recognize the importance of communication in a positive learning environment, psychological safety. They're able to adapt to the learner, so flexibility, and have clinical and technical expertise, great patient care, in form of bond with their learners. So again, these are much the similar themes that were pointed out when they interviewed the attendants, which is encouraging, right? So we're, at least for these two groups of, of small groups of people, they had the same themes as to what we needed to do. Now, what, like I said, what Cotton actually said was, whoever dares to teach must never cease to learn. So I think if you're going to be a teacher, you have to keep learning, right? You can never stop learning. So that's, that's actually, I have nine rules. Rule number four is you can never stop learning. So, you know, how I learn, you know, obviously the research we do pushes me, you know, I work on papers with the residents and, you know, I have to read, I have to educate myself. I have to learn about grounded theory model and social determinants of health. Like I have to educate myself. So I try to try to read a lot, you know, professional stuff, try to do some personal reading on the side, both uh, growth and leadership stuff and some things for fun. And recently I started listening to some podcasts as well. Because, you know, for professional reading, these are like some of my favorite books. The Contrarian's Guide to Leadership, you know, people, the Louisvillians, we have a little bit of reputation being contrary. So it's one of my favorite books. It's a great one. And The Five Dysfunctions of a Team is a fantastic book. If you're a junior faculty and just starting out, I would buy and read Deep Work. It's a fantastic, I wish I read it 20 years ago. Um, it's really, it's about... The subtitle is Rules for a Focused Success in a Distracted World. Great book. And then The Tyranny of Metrics just plays to some of my prejudices. But, as, um, but these are some of my favorites. And then, you know, these are a few things that I read on the side recently. I've just, these are the four books for fun that I've read recently. And if those of you who are old enough, the Claire Lucetti, that's Fred Lucetti's daughter. That's her first novel. A fantastic book. Dr. Garrison, I think you'd actually like this one. Much about four Catholic nuns living in Rhode Island. So, um, those these are the, my most recent fun readings. And then, uh, actually, I'm with me. At, I'm reading the Culture Code right now, um, which is an excellent, excellent book. I'm about two thirds of the way through it. I'll finish it on the plane on the way home. Next up is Quiet: The Power of Introverts in a, in a, in a Noisy World. And then after that, I just ordered The Covenant of Water by Abraham Verghese, who wrote Cutting for Stone. If you haven't read that, it's a fantastic book. Abraham's a, a internal medicine doctor at our place, fascinating human being. So that, that'll be next up on my pile to read. And I recently started listening to podcasts. Unfortunately, I have like a really short commute, so I don't spend a lot of time in the car. But once in a while, I try to listen to, I love Malcolm Gladwell's uh, Revisionist History and, and Seen on Radio. It's so really another great uh, series of podcasts. So, you know, in the last few minutes, I actually want to talk a little bit about the engaged learner. And if this is the one thing where I, I do think that we need to do a little bit of work. Um, I think that we, we, we need to get a little bit more um, proactive, I think, as learners. So what is learning, right? So it's the acquisition of knowledge or skills through experience, study, or being taught. And so, you know, no, no talk is complete without a Dr. Seuss quote. So, you know, Dr. Seuss says, the more you learn, the more places you'll go. So, you know, what does an effective learner require? Well, you have to be self-directed. You have to be inquisitive, curious. You have to be self-aware. You have to be honest with yourself. What do I need to know? Where are my weak spots? Where do I need to focus? You have to take some risks, right? You've got to be open about and not afraid of making mistakes. And I'm, and I'm talking about in your education, not patient care, um, but in your education, you have to be a little bit of a risk taker and be willing to, to put yourself out there. But again, that requires that culture of safety and you have to be open-minded. And so I really think like this idea of being sort of proactive and involved is, is really what we need. Uh, this, this actual happened to me two weeks ago. I was looking at one of my residence evals and the medical student wrote in there, this resident is very intimidating. They require me to prepare for the OR. I think it's much more effective for my learning if I could just come to the OR and ask questions about things I don't know. I was just dumbfounded. 
I sent it to the, to the associate dean of education. I'm like, really? Like, come on. No, this, you know, you got to be engaged and proactive in your education. You cannot just sit there and expect people to, you know, feed you knowledge. So, but again, if you're going to do these things, right, if you're going to take risks, be open minded, you know, you do have to be, you do have to have a little bit of humility about who you are. But the good thing is, rule number six says humility solves most problems. So, you know, if you're, if you're humble, you can ask questions, you can admit what you don't know, you can admit where you need to improve. But humility is a, is a, I have to work on it every day. But humility does help a lot. So again, when you go back to this paper by Bass and them where they looked at what makes an effective educator, you know, one of the things they said in there was residents contribute to making faculty effective educators. You should motivate and inspire your attendees. You know, as a resident, you should be so motivated, hardworking, that I should be embarrassed not to teach you. And I think that's one of the things, one of the messages I could sort of push to our residents as well, too, right? Is it's part of your job is to push me and make me a better educator, make me want to teach you. And, you know, you do that by showing up, being engaged, being proactive, asking questions, you know, pushing your attendance. That's part of your responsibility. And then it's our responsibility to respond in a positive manner and do our job. But I think this is one of those concepts that uh, I think that, that the idea of the engaged learner that needs to be further developed. So my advice to the trainees, you should be a voracious reader. Right? Find a textbook you like and set a reading program. It doesn't have to be huge. If you go back to that book that I talked about, Deep Work by Cal Newport, you know, he talks just little goals. And actually, what he says in there is you should take and you know, put an old-fashioned calendar on your refrigerator and set a goal. I'm going to read in Cameron you know, 15 minutes four times a week. And every time you do, you just put a little gold star on your calendar. And that positive reinforcement actually pushes you to do more. So set a simple goal. I'm two chapters a month, 15 minutes, four times a week, whatever it is. But then, and then keep a scorecard on yourself because it will motivate yourself to do better. We have some of our residents have paired up. We have like these little buddies and they have like two or three of them. We'll do this together and hold each other accountable. But you should, you know, have a regular reading program and you should have goals. But if you don't set a goal, then, you know, it's hard to keep on track. You know, you should get a journal and, and give them the table of contents every month. As a resident, you know, there's a lot in there. I think I focus on clinical trials and guideline consensus statements that are going to affect how you take care of patients. And then I think you should try to read something outside of medicine. I don't think I ever read a novel the entire time I was a resident or the first couple years I was a faculty. Pretty embarrassing, right? But it's, it's hard when you're a resident. But you should at least try to read some articles and stuff outside of medicine. So we have these things I, I started a little while ago called Sunday morning sermons. So every Sunday morning at 8 o'clock, I send a little something out to our residents. And there's usually a short article attached. It might be something from like the Harvard Business Review, something else, or something I found online that I thought was interesting. And it's usually some non-clinical topic, maybe about leadership skills or interactions and stuff. And so we try to get them to do every Sunday morning a little bit of reading outside of medicine. I think the residents, survey residents, I think in particular, are generally good at this, developing your own teaching skills. You know, for most medical students, the most memorable person in medical school is usually your chief resident on surgery. Now, now they tend to have a competitive advantage because they're usually like PGY 5, 6, or 7s, whereas your chief resident on medicine is you know, PGY 2 or 3. So surgery residents have been around a long time. But, you know, develop your own teaching skills and your own styles. And then again, your job as a resident is to strive, you should strive to inspire your attendees. You know, and uh, I mentioned Abraham Verghese, quite a great guy. And, you know, he, he's really pushed a lot to sort of bringing the humanity back to medicine and bringing us back to the bedside in the, in the personal and physical interactions. And as he said, you know, me medicine is messy and complicated because humans are messy and complicated, but that's why he loves it. 
And what all of us in the trenches, housekeepers, nurses, nurses, therapists, doctors, you know, what we all have in common is that humanity. You know, we all came to this for a lot of reasons, but it sobers me how many people came because they had a sense of calling, because they genuinely care about what happens to patients. So again, I think teaching and learning are a way for us to return some humanity to medicine when all the forces around us are often trying to push it out. Well, again, it's been a great honor to share some of my thoughts about surgical education this morning, and it's been a privilege. I deeply appreciate the invitation, especially in, you know, in the names of Dr. Griswold and Richardson. Thank you very much. Very thoughtful and thought-provoking uh, topic and discussion. I think it all gives us a lot of things to ponder. I guess I'll lead off with a question. I mean, it certainly seems like technology is important and you want to try to leverage that. It, it also seems like the new buzz topic is sort of adult learning and skills of adult learning and styles of adult learning. That's infiltrated a lot of things. Uh, you know, ATLS has been completely revamped in many of those kinds of things, but how do you avoid sounding like an anti-technology, anti-adult learning dinosaur, and yet blend some of those topics uh, without getting bogged down in sort of peripheral details and noise and, and things that may not always directly translate to being able to educate people about medicine and surgery? Yeah, it's, it's a challenge, right? It, it, you know, it's, it's a generational thing too, right? Like, you know, I got so frustrated with my kids when they were in high school because they would study a certain way and it was just not the way I would do things, right? But again, I, I, you know, they've never not known one of these things, right? These, these didn't exist when I was a resident, right? My cell phone was a roll of quarters. I, I knew where every pay phone was between my house and the, and the hospital. But, you know, and so this idea that you have to know everything or you have to memorize everything when you can look it up in four seconds on Google. You know, so what they need to know has changed. And I think, you know, the idea of these, you know, 45 minute lectures, probably a little bit antiquated. You know, we have our trauma conference, like everything's like you know, 10, 15 minute lectures. So, I mean, it's tough because it's, I think small snippets are generally better, but there are some things that are hard to cover without sort of doing a deep dive. So. I don't know. It's 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 a it's a tough one. That's something, man. I was wondering when you told us about the aortic uh Dr. Harbrick that seven words, I was wondering off your Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I've been known to exaggerate on occasion. <laughs> You can tell that Dr. Spain is a truly a dedicated presentation today. Dr. Miller and Dr. Richardson, who was an incredibly proud of talk today. But as we serve on the American Board of Surgery, we get to uh, listen to a lot of self-professed surgical education experts sometimes wonder if you ask their residents about the family of with excellent surgeons and nevertheless there's a lot of language that they not understand the education the magic of frank miller was really quite simple and uh, Dr. Miller, I suppose, created a culture of safety because he was very friendly to everyone. Uh, he made fun, non threatening for the students. Uh, but really, all Frank did was talk about what he was doing as he was working, ask questions. And the questions he asked were very simple questions, but he did it consistently. Everything that he did. When asking the medical student, you know, what are we doing? Why are we here? What's wrong with this patient? Uh, you know, 
how are we putting in this all we can or I mean it was it was simple but magical he engaged everyone in learning from the student residents and allowed a certain degree of autonomy that he was comfortable with and I think we could all learn a lot from that I try to remember that but you know it's difficult to remember that really what students uh, and learners wants is for you to be engaged with their education you don't have to think of brilliant questions to ask you just need to talk about what you're doing explain what you're doing and ask questions about what you're doing and why you're doing it will go a long way for improving the learning yeah, agreed right there there are a lot of um you know people who are trained educators right I'll understand adult learning theory a lot better than I do, um, but but there is something to be said about just right that consistency and that dedication, right? And, and really, I think that's probably the, the hallmark, right? Just consistent dedication, you know, genuine interest, and it, it, Gary, it doesn't take much. And I think, unfortunately, you know, as we've all gotten busier, the pressures, the time crunch, the you know, work RVUs, eighty-hour work week, oversight. You know, all the expectations have changed. And I think that, you know, unfortunately, sometimes teaching is the first thing that goes by the wayside. But as you point out, it's, it's not that hard to do, right? All that can be incorporated while, while, you know, in the OR while you're doing things. Like it doesn't, you don't have to take 45 minutes out of the day and do a PowerPoint presentation. You can ask some really simple questions in the OR, right? And have a huge uh, input. So it is that dedication and consistency, I think that's crucial. Okay. So, thank you for great talk. So, when you were the trauma fellow for Brian as the chief, I was a fourth year medical student. So, we've known each other a long time. When I came back on the faculty. All right, as a trauma fellow, faculty, I appreciate his input to my skill set about how to work it out. Uh, I want to ask a, a question that you touched on. What do you think the role of a didactic lecture is to the 21st century? So, uh, not a grand rounds like this, where there's not as much interaction with these young people up here like coats, but a classroom setting where you can, you know, be an effective educator and engage them, but a sit down. Lecture, what is the role of that to the 21st century learner? Because it, to me, it seems to be fading, meaning I got to shift more to the Frank Miller model. Question. True, right? I think, right? I, there's, it's less than less, but I do, I do, you know, we've been trying to put a lot of emphasis sort of on this flipped classroom idea that rather than just coming and hearing a lecture and trying to absorb it, you have to come prepared. Right, so much. I think it's much easier to push content out to students beforehand, and so you know a lot of the stuff in our medical school we're really trying to say like you know you you need to do this before you come to class, right? You're not going to have an hour lecture. You're, you know the class time is going to be shortened, but you need to prepare and come come ready. Um, you know now whether they actually do it, good question. But you know most of the time, you know they would just come to lecture and try to soak it in. So. Um, you know, again, everybody learns differently, right? The environment's completely changed. Like I said, you know, everybody has one of these, like they're called smartphones for a reason because they can help make you smart. But, you know, I mean, how much did they have to absorb it? They can, you know, they, you know, we used to ask residents questions in the middle of the night and they didn't know the answer and thought it was terrible. But I don't know, do I have to memorize all that stuff when I can look it up on Google and, you know, I can get an answer? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm still a little bit of a dinosaur, but times change. Well, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate all the information and, and the perspective. Uh, again, we've got a traditional gift that we will uh, provide as well as a local gift to all of our named lectures. And so that will be something for you to take back with you, hopefully remember us a little bit. Uh, but thank you, everybody, for attending. And we'll get to QI conference uh, very shortly. Thank you.